it's horrible knowing that there's people in the cell screaming and shouting, banging next to you, and you don't belong in that place. You know, in your head, you don't. And then your your mental health just starts deteriorating so quickly the, from the second that you walk through that door and they shut it behind you. January 2016, um, police officer knocked on my door and we had a bit of a, not necessarily a tiff, but a bit of a confrontation in that aspect because I knew that there was no reason for them to actually be there in my mind because I knew I hadn't done anything that could have even brought them there, let alone what I was accused of. Um, and so when they initially came in, my mum was like, the police want to speak to you, um, can, you know, what's going on? Uh, and so I went, I don't know, they, they've asked, you know, we went up to the door, do you mind coming down for questioning? I'm not dressed. And that, for them, that was a sign of guilt. That, not that I wasn't dressed, it was more um, the sense of, I asked if they reminded me of getting changed when I went down there. and. That was then when they went. Oh, can you jump out of a can you jump out of a window? Is there a back window? You can jump out. Is there a back door? And all of these questions that are all like, oh, is he going to escape? And I've not even I don't even know what they're here for yet. You know, they haven't said you're accused of this, this, and this. That that came about half an hour later. Um, and so you know, what I said seemed sarcastic, and it wasn't. I, I said, do you mind if I speak while I get dressed, so then you can hear that I'm still in the house and I'm still here. And if my voice starts fading too much, then you know. I, be going somewhere. And um, one of the police officers laughed because he thought I was being just sarky and the other one just took it very seriously and went to walk through the door and I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And you have a police officer and my mum having a confrontation about like, you know, don't, don't come in the house. You, you don't even have any reason. You haven't given any explanation as to why you're at the door, let alone trying to get into the house. They didn't say you were under arrest? No, no, no. Th those, that didn't come out of anybody's mouth. You know, there were no handcuffs out. There was no nothing. It was, do you mind coming down for the, to the station for some questions? It was very film-like, you know, and it was, it, it's a weird experience in, it, in the sense of, I thought if you were under arrest, they'd tell you there and then straight away. I get into the car and then they tell me that there's been some serious accusations made against me um, and that I'm under arrest. Um, and then they detail what the accusations were, but not in depth about exactly how the accusations go on um, and so forth from that. And we get down to the police station and you know I wait six and a half hours or something stupid in a holding cell. Um, one of the police officers was nice enough to offer me a curry for dinner, um, which I turned down. Uh, I didn't trust it. And, um, you know, it, it, it's horrible knowing that there's people in the cell screaming and shouting, banging next to you, and you don't belong in that place. You know, in your head you don't, and then your, your mental health just starts deteriorating so quickly the, from the second that you walk through that door and they shut it behind you of that I'm not supposed to be here and you can't you don't want to be the person that's screaming and shouting let me out let me out because you look crazy but that's what your head is doing your head is sitting there telling you that ask them questions they must have made a mistake this must be wrong you know where's this come from who said it who's done this who's done what you know where could this have possibly got to this stage um, and so you know uh, the questioning, it was fairly casual, it was just asking backdated on the relationship um, across the time span, which uh, it was from that day, it would have been about two, three years around that sort of time length. Um, and it's just crazy, because when, when I hesitated at one point, they asked me if I had, um, if we tried something or something, something along those lines. Yeah. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm trying to think back, it's a long time ago, so I, I took a little bit of time to think back because I'm trying to be as honest as possible in this stage um, and cooperate. And that got taken as a sign of guilt instead. And it's weird how those things can just be jumped on. Um, and it's very easy for it to be jumped on, I suppose. The police officer tried to get on with. You know, after I'd been released and everything like that, um, I was the one that was calling him, I was the one that was in constant contact with him. So the per very person that's investigating it, I was the one that was asking, you know, okay, well, have a decision ma been made yet? You know, have, have you finally found the truth? Um, and I'm, my anxiety is kicking in because I'm in the middle of my university degree. I'm at work. I'm, you know, I have a normal life and a very extraordinary life in the sense of this doesn't, in my mind, this didn't happen to everyone. Um, I now come to believe that actually <laughs> this happens a lot more frequently than people imagine. Um, and I suppose. I think the, the mismatch in that, the disparity in the figures, is that you know 5% are falsely accused and 95% are, are real. 
I think a lot of that is, there's a lot of the no further actions that don't get classed as a false accusation, but do get classed as actually somebody was raped, but it didn't, they didn't go through, it wasn't convicted. And that baffles me to this day still, because if it's no further action, then take a neutral point of view, that it could have happened or it couldn't have happened, but there's no definitive answer right now to say that it did happen, which means there's no definitive answer, you know, possibly that it didn't happen, but then you remain neutral in it, not jump straight away to the fact that uh, it happened, they just couldn't find the right evidence to prove it. Well, that's not true, because then you could say it the other way around, you know, well, it didn't happen, they just couldn't find the right evidence that, to say that it didn't happen. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's how you look at it, it's perspectives, I suppose, it's interpretation of the situation. Um, and I think that's where part of it is going wrong. There's a lot of things that are going wrong, yeah. um, you know, for falsely accused and all sorts of being a, the accused of a crime in general. Um, uh, and so I'd, I'd waited, I had an agent at the police station, it was very, I didn't know anything about it, didn't even know who my legal representation was going to be, I was just told to wait. Um, and we go from there really is six months of waiting, seven months of waiting, um, July is supposed to be the date. And we turn up to the police station and the solicitors that I've just been given that I had no contact with turns up. Um, but the police officer in charge doesn't. No, we waited two and a half hours outside. And my solicitor was a wonderful man, um, bless him. He decided to say that because of the waiting time, there's a strong possibility that I could be being charged and they're just making preparations to charge me. Little obviously did he know that the police officer in charge just wasn't turning up um, and they couldn't get hold of him. But at that point, that's when you start saying goodbye to your family and your friends and everything. And, and I remember going in that watching my friends and family cry for the first time properly in this, I suppose, because it was, what if we don't see you again? And that's when the reality sets in. And it's a little bit awkward to then go back out and be like, oh, we're all good now. We're going to be rebelled. Um, and no date was set. So this was the first problem, was no date was set. So there was no guarantee of when the decision was going to be made. So I call, I call, I call, I call, I call, make phone calls to the police officer in charge, make phone calls to, I think I managed to get through to my solicitor once. And that was after about a month of being uh, of being rebailed. And then after that, it just didn't get anything back from him. Um, and that was that. I didn't really speak to my solicitor. Um, so what, what, fast forward to February, I think now, about February. Um, and then it's towards the end of it, uh, uh, make a phone call to the police officer. Has the decision been made? Oh, it's with the CPS. They're making a decision. I'll see if I can get it fast-tracked a little bit, see if they can jump it up a little bit. Um, and two hours later, I got a phone call back saying, I'm really sorry, you've been charged. Um, and the hard part is, uh, it's embarrassing. I collapsed in the middle of university because that was when I took the phone call. Um, and I just fell to my knees, that was it. We was in a complete state of shock. I was the one that was telling my family that we can't be certain that it's gonna end in no further action because we just don't know. It's 50-50 at the moment because it's my word against hers, there's no evidence. And this is our point was, it's harder to, it's just as hard to disprove this situation as it is to prove it. Um, and I, I think that's a difficult concept to grasp is, so the mind naturally just goes to the point of, well, why would you lie? And, and that's where that whole, you kind of want to believe the victim because it's, it's more of a monstrosity to think that they would lie about such something so serious than they, they actually just made the false accusation. You know, it, it's something we can't comprehend. It's something that even I couldn't comprehend. Me and my mum were a whole no smoke without fire kind of family yeah. um, in general that you, maybe they didn't necessarily do that, but there must have been something that was a bit off. Uh, and now it's just, it changed your whole perspective. And I think people will only ever really get that. There's a rare few people that do without having to go through it. But I think only people that go through it really understand. You know, we, we got charged, it was all a bit of a mess. My mum Googled whether or not I'd be held on remand. Like, Google's not your friend um, in any way, shape or form. To the point where my mum packed a toothbrush, contact lenses and all sorts as if I was going camping. Um, I, I love her to pieces for it because she was prepared, she, she knew what was going on and I had no idea. I was just going to turn up to the police station and wing it really and improvise the whole thing from there as to what happens next. So if I get held in remand, then we'll deal with it. But I know that I'm innocent so I'm going to come back out. I'm adamant I'm coming back out if I go in remand. Um, and then my mum just came in crying in the morning and she said, you know, I've been looking it up online, you're, you're going to be held in remand. Um, and at this point, probably about a couple of weeks prior, we'd found out that my solicitor that I was given went bust for dishonesty in court, which is all the things that you want to hear, um, all the kinds of reputa representation you want. And I'd done work experience for a law firm before, so the, the only people that I could call 
Um, and they were very much more informative. And I think there's people that are lucky enough to get solicitors like that. Um, and I couldn't give them full credit if, you know, until I'm blue in the face, because it's, they were amazing from start to finish, as was Julia, um, but Simone as well, who just doesn't receive any credit really in the media because she wasn't the, physically in the media, if that makes sense. They weren't the first person she went to, but she, she was fantastic. She, she gave all the information, don't panic, don't do this, don't dress like this, put your hair like this, because this is what people need to look like in court. Um, and that's just a representation thing for yourself. Your image reflects how you are as a person, your behavior. Um, and we went off and did our research, you know, we're six months down the line, then that's trial date. Um, there's nothing more depressing than three weeks after your birthday is being the trial date, your first trial date, because the, you know three weeks prior you're celebrating what could be your last birthday with everyone. Um, and so that was tough. I think that was one of the tougher parts. And in the build up to that, I'd said goodbye to work, I'd said goodbye to um, people at university, I'd say goodbye to distant friends, I'd brought over relatives and I think the night before the trial actually started I think we met with like 30, 40, 50 people um, I just put them all in one room, just met them at different times throughout the whole day and it's really depressing to say that that was what was supposed to be a good luck thing kind of became a goodbye, may never see you again kind of meeting um, and some people were adamant that this wasn't going to be the last time you know, and you know because we'd held that view before I was charged and then we got burnt because of it. I didn't want to hold that view going into the trial because mm. we'd planned everything. I, tra I was transferring all the money out to my mum's account. I was transferring any sort of possession that I had to my, you know, I was thinking about my other half, how was, the things were going to go there and, and my best friends, whether or not, who's going to, silly things like who's going to own my PlayStation 4, you know, who's that going to go to? But it's, it sounds silly, but you want to make sure that everything is accommodated for and the little details are the ones that matter the most. Um, and I suppose the most valuable things in terms of property that you own, you want to make sure that that is going somewhere and isn't going to be confiscated for whatever reason, um, like my phone was. Um, and so trial date kicks in and on the first day of court, the first thing that happens is Oh, by the way, we, we kind of missed that actually it's 13 counts of sexual assault and rape. Sorry, uh, we've just reread the um, statement and there's one separate sexual assault count. So we're, gonna, we're, we're asking the judge to, to put up to 13 sexual assaults and, and rape counts. And that was obviously the prosecution that did that. And that's your first moment. That's the first thing that's decided in court. We'd waited for four or five hours because there was a trial that carried over. Fair enough, it happens. Then they couldn't find a jury on the day, so they asked for any of the admin stuff to be dealt with now, and everyone will go home. So I spent an hour in the courtroom, and actually spent, actually in court, it's in the actual court itself, probably about five, six hours. We come in the next day, uh, and there's messages. Um, all of a sudden, they've appeared in the disclosure pack. Uh, and Julia starts asking questions of where, where did these come from? You just said that on Liam's phone, you couldn't find anything, you could only find Snapchat messages when his was confiscated. So where have these messages come from? Um, and it was a conversation between her and uh, one of the witnesses. I'll put it in quotation marks like that. Um, but th it was a conversation there of the first time she'd reported it to someone, essentially. Um, and that was what the conversation covered. But in that conversation was a text that outright said, uh, it wasn't against my will or anything. And we hit the roof. Well, I mean, I hit the roof. My barrister was a bit taken aback that that was even sitting there. And that was what the prosecution were relying on, was in that string of conversation, that message that outright said I was innocent, was what they were relying on to prosecute me. How can that be? This is the point. And this is why I don't necessarily, part of me thinks that they didn't read it in full. The other part of me thinks that maybe they thought it would go unnoticed. And the other part of me just thinks that it was just completely malicious. And, and, and as people say, there was a culture of convictions at all costs. And in all honesty, I'm never, nobody's ever really going to know it, from the police officer's perspective what his mindset was. Because even in the review, it said that he doesn't know, he doesn't remember how he recorded the information, doesn't remember how he recorded the evidence, like in uh, the text messages, and he doesn't remember how he documented it all. But he's claimed that he did. So, again, it could go one or two ways. It was either malicious, and he did read it, and he didn't care, or it was just a genuine mistake, an oversight, he's too busy lack of competency, that kind of thing. Um, 
And so there's a number of reasons it could have been. Um, and so we go into the courtroom and we ask where the messages have come from uh, and we ask for essentially for us to get the disc that they've downloaded it on. Um, and we're told in court, no, it's only a couple of thousand messages. And, you know, I don't even think Jerry knew how much was on there. No. Um, because he was the one that said to the judge, you know, it's only a couple of thousand messages, but he was getting that information from the police officer in charge. Yeah. Jerry had only picked up the case the day before. There's no way he would have known or seen that evidence in the first place. But a prosecution barrister did. That's my problem. Because there was one on the case before and the prosecution barrister signed off for it, which means they either didn't look at it as well, or they looked at it and didn't care. Either way, we weren't told that this evidence even existed, let alone put in unused material. Um, and we start going through it and we, we, you know, we start sifting through it, me and Julia. Um, so Julia's gone home to do it, I've gone home to do it. Um, and this is my issue is a lot of people have said, well, they've got lack of resources, lack of timing. I had an eight hour time deadline, realistically, for me to be able to go back to sleep, wake up the next day for court. Julia had the same sort of deadline uh, from when we finished court to go and read through that. And both of us just had a laptop and that download, which was on a disc. Nobody can tell me that they don't have enough resources, that they don't even have a laptop to look through something. And if, it, it, maybe it's a different generation, control F and you type in keywords, every keyword like that you've just listed on that document will come up and it will highlight, which means then you can look for this key information that you're looking for. So we initially typed in rape. Rape didn't turn up, turned up no results. So not in any single conversation that she had had in this whole time span of two to three years had the word rape ever been mentioned. Brilliant. That's actually a good thing. That's, you know, what we were looking for was how it was depicted, how it was described, you know, exactly what the words were to see, well, this doesn't match up with what she's said here or this doesn't match up here, here, here. And so we do that throughout the whole thing. Um, and then eventually we start finding all of these bits of information. Um, and obviously I can't go into depth about it, but it was so abundantly clear to a neutral person that I was innocent from the, the examples that we'd given in court that it would have been abundantly clear before I was even arrested. So this was a whole big waste of time. This was two years gone for no reason. But that's also a conspiracy to pervert the course of justice because it was there before you were charged. Exactly. It was there before I was arrested. Yeah. So, you know, it, I think it was there for nine days or a week before I was arrested. Why download it and then arrest somebody if you haven't investigated it? I don't think anybody should be arrested if it hasn't already been investigated because if you investigate it and you find actually there's nothing there or you think that there could be something there you just can't find the other evidence so you need to question the other person, I can understand that. I can understand somebody needing to be questioned. That is a process that just needs to happen. But to be charged, to go through the court process, to do all of that and the evidence, now people are telling me that the evidence wasn't even looked at still why am I even in the courtroom? If you ask me would I have waited an extra six months to find out whether or not I was going to be charged with no further action, if it meant somebody was going to properly read that document, hell yeah! Hell yeah! That would have been an easy decision. That would have... That's a no-brainer. Everyone brainer. in the world would agree with you. You find the evidence and you wait. You happily wait. Yeah. And, you know, I was offered a, a plea deal of, I think it's three and a half years or something like that, or seven years, or something stupid, um, to plead guilty. And I'm a very stubborn person, it's just my personality. I've probably got it off mum, my mum's pretty similar in that respect, but I was stubborn enough in the sense of, we didn't even know that the evidence to prove I was innocent was there, but we was adamant that I was gonna be able to get up into a courtroom and look the people in the eyes and say to them outright, this did not happen, this was a lie. And we had character references, you know, originally I think I submitted a list of like 40, some stupid character references of people that knew what was going on. I was very open about it and said, look, this is exactly what's going on, but I need your help. And then I got told off because I'm not allowed to have 40 character references come from standing court um, because it's too long. It would be too long a process. And I understand that, you know, all of them are going to want to speak for 20 minutes to the half an hour. And, you know, there'd be two sets of questioning and all sorts of so go wrong. So we narrowed it down to, I think, 12 in the end. Um, and this is ex-girlfriends. This is all sorts. Um, family members, friends, the works. And despite having 12 people there, people still took a week off for my trial and came and sat in that trial. And we had about 15 people at one point. There was nobody on her side of it. And the, the harder part of it is, is obviously we want to make it obvious that they're there for me and not to see the result for her. Um, and so we're constantly looking at each other, I'm looking at the jury and every, uh, making sure that they're aware that they're with me and things like that. So any kind of eye contact with those members in the gallery um, was, was imperative because if they saw that, 
they can also see that I'm with them um, and that's my support and compare it to what she had I suppose is, is the bigger thing of it and I think it's rare that you get that many people turn up. I've turned up to sentence and hearings as part of my course and all sorts um, to, to just see what the experience was like um, and write reports on it essays and things like that and there's never ever been that many people I've seen in a public gallery um, but that was normal for me. This is my family, my friends and my family. I, I have a great aunt and uncle and a few cousins here and there and, and my mum and that's it. Um, and I predominantly just see my mum. My mum is the only person that I was living with at the time of it all. Um, and so it, it keeps you open-minded that my friends would be like my family. Um, and that's a really hard thing to try and explain to people who come from a big family. And so we're trying to rely on the fact that the jury have had experience. And this is going past the fact that we weren't aware that the message of the CPS were going to drop the case. It wasn't dropped there and then in court when we found those messages that the CPS were going to suddenly, just suddenly went, no, that's it, we'll back off. No, no, it was two weeks. So two, two weeks, two weeks afterwards, they had to send off a recommendation for them to drop the case um, or whether or not they were going to go through. Now, the, the catch bit for me was I was in the third year of uni. It was coming up to the end of it. This is where every minute counted towards my degree. On the day my trial started, a de uh, essay was due in. Um, and so I had to apply for extenuating circumstances and all, all that. The, re the, the retrial date that they set, because that was just a precaution in case the CPS did decide to carry on, um, was July the next year. So it would have been another nine months of just sitting around and waiting. But knowing now that there's evidence that proved I was innocent, but they still want to go through with the case. And they would have been stupid to, but it wouldn't have been uncommon for them to do it, to take it to trial anyways and to test the luck. because. I don't think, I think if uh, there's a criteria isn't there, 50%, if there's a more than a likelihood of 50% yeah, conviction, then they're supposed to, yeah. Mine probably had 30% without the evidence, because statements weren't matching up, the timings weren't matching up, I had exact proof of where I was, she was, people were, um, at places that we were, through bank cards and, and statements and things like that, you know, it's, it's silly things, but all of that was in our favour and it was still taken to trial and in my, in my honest opinion it was 30% it depended on whether or not the jury were going to properly believe her there were three people in the jury that had already decided I was guilty and they, I'm assuming they've read the news I'm assuming they have and seen that actually they were wrong but that's scary because I hadn't even spoken we need people on the other side to start accepting the fact that false accusations do happen and they're not as rare as what people think. That doesn't mean they're not necessarily completely rare. I don't know how rare they are. I don't think anybody's really going to be able to find the exact statistic of how many, exactly how many rapes actually happen and how many rapes are false, like, you know, how many reports of rape are false. But they're more common than people think. They're a lot more common. The only difference is, I suppose, is that there's not that much encouragement to speak up about being falsely accused. You know. I'm, I'm on the sofa at the moment, you know, speaking about it because my case is in the media, but nobody would have ever heard of me and I would never have spoken about it because it wouldn't be publicised. Whereas, you read the news, we, we did a, a course uh, in my criminology bit, we did a module, and it had to be about the reporting of um, crimes in the, in the newspapers. And it was just purely education type of thing. Um, and we started to look that a lot of the things that are put in there, um, a lot of it was strange danger um, in terms of rape. A lot of it was uh, rape, but it's all very much focused on what could happen and it's very unrealistic of how frequently it happens because it was reported a stupid amount of times but when you actually look at it, most of the any kind of domestic violence or, or abuse or anything like that happens in the home. But all of the news reports were on stuff that happened out in the street and so I think there's a fear now instilled in men and I think there's a fear that's been instilled in women. and. Media is partly to blame, they've been the catalyst for it, but I think that there's been a bit of confusion between the difference of exactly what constitutes as rape, exactly what constitutes as consent, and a lot of people will say, well no, surely it's really obvious that somebody either says yes, they do want to have sex, or no, they don't want to have sex. But if you ask those people how many times they've actually been asked, shall we have sex, mm. or does it just happen in the heat of the moment, none of, all of them pause and they get a little bit conscious because then it becomes a bit of a grey area of, Oh, no, 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 no. But then if somebody says afterwards, well, they, did, they, they felt really uncomfortable, they didn't really want it, but they didn't say anything, and they didn't really make it too obvious, 
that's, there's grey areas, there's, there's, a, there's a boundary because then there's certain contexts of it that you will never understand. There's certain facial expressions that the guy may never have seen or the girl may never have seen. Because it works both ways. But I think there's a fear now. There's a fear for a guy to approach a girl and there's a fear for a girl to be approached by a guy. And that's just not... What's the point in living if you can't live in harmony? Well, it doesn't make sense. Um, and I, the, po the biggest point that I really want to make is this whole, this doesn't get votes this whole topic of interest doesn't get votes and that's why Parliament aren't interested is nonsense. It's controversial. That's why Parliament aren't necessarily don't want to get too invested in it because there's a lot of people out there that want to be spiteful. There's a lot of people that I've met that have outright accused me of what I was accused of again despite the fact that there's evidence showing that I was innocent through Twitter. And there's people that I have spoken to through Twitter or seen through Twitter that have been malicious to people on, on the flip side of it there's a danger of the emotion getting too much of people um, and I do my best to control the people that I'm close with um, and in regular contact with and saying look this can't be this way but there's a ton of votes in, in this there really is you change the criminal justice system every criminal barrister in the country will vote along with all the people that have been damaged by the criminal justice system and all the families and you're speaking what million votes yeah. easily uh, that's what I don't even know what the population is in it in the UK to be fair now. So you know that's one million votes realistically for people that have just been partly affected or are working in that profession, and then it will have a ripple effect from there. And and that's the scary part of it is that nobody's realising that yet.